Welcome to Life at the Academy, a midshipman-produced podcast that examines how the culture, traditions, and daily life of midshipmen have evolved over time. I'm midshipman Nels Waranimi. And I'm midshipman Calvin Tran. The aim of our podcast is to examine the history of the culture at the Naval Academy. But we found that when we're examining the culture at this institution, we needed a broader toolkit for how to examine the culture, as we are not trained anthropologists. So we wanted to have a better vocabulary for how to talk about culture. That is why today we have brought in a special guest, Dr. Fujimura, who is the sole anthropologist at the United States Naval Academy. We're really excited to have her today because as an anthropologist, she'll be able to give us an actual scientific framework of how to define culture and how we can examine culture throughout time within the academy. For me specifically, Nels, I'm really excited to hear about how she looks at informal culture, culture among the brigade itself, and the organizational culture, how the institution tries to develop its culture. And she has a unique perspective as well as a professor here. So she has a front line view of how the culture at the Naval Academy works. And she also has extensive experience in studying culture. Yes, for sure. And I think one really interesting thing that we can learn from her today is in our in a second class, we've taken we've learned in leadership class the importance of establishing good culture. We've learned about the iceberg model and how we can see different levels of culture, whether it's from the way the slang that the academy has or the monuments or the buildings and, and historical people that we look up to. And I think not only from the perspective of learning the academy culture, it would be beneficial from this podcast, but I think it's interesting for us as future officers to understand, have a better understanding of culture and how as future Marine Corps officers and Naval officers, you know, how we can establish culture within and within our billets and our jobs and our careers. Yeah, that's exactly right. Culture is all around us. So knowing more about it and how to study it will only benefit us in the future, I think. Calvin, do you want to introduce our guest? As the sole anthropologist at the Naval Academy, Professor Clementine Fujimura has served the Naval Academy community extensively since 1993, supporting the mission in creating adaptable, successful officers who will lead a diverse Navy and Marine Corps at home and abroad. She has proven indispensable in the development of cross-cultural competence among midshipmen in the Languages and Culture Department, the School of Humanities and Social Sciences, on the yard as a co-creator and leader of the new Foreign Studies major, and as a member of of a variety of other mission-critical programs. She has developed much of the coursework in the Foreign Area Studies and currently teaches three of the essential classes, as well as language classes in German and Russian. She has supported the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership, the Leadership, Ethics, and Law Department, and the International Programs Office. She has worked tirelessly to support faculty and staff in their pursuit of success at USNA as a lead in the Cross-Cultural Competence Workshop for faculty and coordinator of the mentorship program in her department. With that, here was our conversation with Dr. Fujimura. Professor Fujimura, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So to start off, what is culture and how do you approach the study of culture as a whole? Okay, so those are two separate questions, but I guess I'll start with a definition of culture that there are many definitions and depending on who you talk to, and I'm not sure who else you've talked to about this, they'll give you a different definition. Everyone has their own and it's often, you know, strategic, like what are we trying to learn? So for me as an anthropologist, the definition that works is that it's a system of understandings, of shared understandings, that are communicated, right, over time, passed on from generation to generation, expressed in symbolic ways, either through language that can be verbal or nonverbal, right? And these shared understandings include traditions and values and belief systems, right? And so that is really what we're looking at when we talk about culture. And what's most important about culture is that through this lens of culture, through these perceptions and understandings, we also perceive the world around us, we perceive each other, and we perceive ourselves. So that is how our own identity is formed. We form our own identity through the culture in which we were raised. So that would be my definition. And then what do I do as an anthropologist? I try to study how people think about the world, each other, and how they learned this 
these beliefs, the values, and also the behaviors that ensue. So why do people do what they do because of the culture within which they were raised or within which they exist right now? And so that, that's, that's what I study. My, in my research, I studied Russian culture. But again, that's a huge topic, right? What's Russian culture? So I, at the time for my dissertation, I narrowed it down to the education system. And even as I spent a lot of time there, I started looking at groups of children that were treated differently. And I ended up studying homeless children in Russia, that subculture of Russia. So do I know a lot about all of Russia? I know a lot about a few places, right, a few things in Russia. But, but again, what are their beliefs? What are the values? Why do children, why do they become homeless? Why are they treated as orphans? Why, do they, why are they institutionalized? And how does that happen? How might that be different from how we treat children with problematic homes here in the United States? And those are two very different things, it turns out. Professor, the Naval Academy does have a strong and distinctive culture, and it seems like that culture has developed in the short span of plebe summer and plebe year. How do you think that culture is established so early on and so quickly? So I would like to start by saying that this is, of course, my opinion as what I've seen as an anthropologist um, and having actually spoken to lots of midshipmen over time. But there's, I don't see the Naval Academy as one culture. There is that. There is the culture that is established by, you know, tradition, by history, by the top-down approach, who's in charge, the superintendent, the board, you know, alumni. They, they establish a certain culture, but that's not everything, right? So from that moment that you become a plebe, you're indoctrinated a little bit into this system, right? But you also establish your own subcultures or co-cultures, whichever you want to call it. That is really the fabric, I think, of what makes this place really unique and special. Um, it's different from it in other colleges, for example. The clubs you have, social events you have, the things that happen, of course, that are shown to the rest of Annapolis and the rest of the world, that is one culture. But there is so much more to it than that. So I hate to think of it as a monolith. I think of it as a very vibrant, dynamic, um, moving you know, community. And yes, of course, you can call it a culture, but it's, I hate to define it very rigidly. Does that make sense to you? Was yeah. that, did that answer your question? And how does it happen so fast was your question. Well, I think the top-down part is, is immediately. I think as you, the, the, the moment that you apply to the Naval Academy, you're thinking about what that might be like. And some of you might have family members who can tell you about it. You might have you know, friends, your advisors. You might, have, you might have come here for the summer programs and hadn't gotten an idea of what it will be like. So you've bought into it a little bit. And you're ready for some interesting, complicated, but very serious and fun times all at, at once, right? And so the first part is very serious, right? You're told this is how you behave, this is what you have to do, and that is something you basically signed up for when you applied. And then when you got in and you said, yes, I'm coming, right? So that's, that happens very, very fast. And then comes the whole plebe summer where you go, hmm, is that what I thought it was? And then again, you kind of, you go with the flow and you buy into it and then you sign your two for seven, right? So you have to make very big decisions very, very fast just because of all the paperwork that you're given, right? And because of the commitments that you have to make and to put on that uniform and have that head shaved and go by all these rules. So that's something that is, in a sense, you know, it's, I don't know if it's indoctrination, if that's the correct word, but it's a very quick kind of feeding of the culture to you. And you've already said yes, you know, when you drove up with your parents and were ready to say goodbye. The other part of it um, happens, I think, more slowly. And it happens as you build relationships uh, with each other and you find your niche, be it your sports team, be it your other, you know, subcultures, as I said before, the clubs that you join. So that would be your, your, your community. And um, that establishes sometimes in reaction to the top-down culture that you're fed. And sometimes because it's just something you've always been interested in. So it's not necessarily a reaction to anything, but because it's an interest you have. And that develops a little bit more slowly. It has to happen after plebe summer, maybe your plebe year, you gradually flow into it, unless you're like recruited for a sports team. But even then, you have to find your place on the team, right? So that happens more slowly. But then that two for seven, I think, is big. 
you know now you're like okay I'm, I'm committed and I'm gonna make the best of this place that I can and suddenly this energy I think that's like a, a surge of energy and I think it's because I think I, and if you think of it as happening fast I guess it's fast but that has happened a little bit more slowly and now from what I understand and you tell me if I'm wrong um, but now you really start to develop this pride this pride has, is that's actually maybe even from day one, but it becomes even stronger in the, in the sense of commitment um, co becomes even stronger, right? Um, and and I do think it's one of I think something you might have wanted to ask me later on about, um, but the sense of duty, um, the sense of camaraderie that's just so strong here at the Naval Academy really I think keeps you going and and, and builds that intense culture that we're talking about. Now, I want to ask you, though, did I get that right? For me personally, after signing two for seven, seeing my classmates, seeing my old company mates, seeing the mutual sense of duty, it builds stronger um, as the, the time goes by at the academy. And I would say that even though as a second class right now, there are some cynical moments thinking, you know, three more semesters to graduation. I do at the same time think that it's quickly coming to an end. And I want to enjoy my last couple semesters with my within my own group within my own subcultures within my niches and that's something i look forward to in the coming time yeah i agree with it but something that's unique in me and calvin's experience at the academy has been the shotgun shifting companies halfway through so you talked about it taking a while for that subculture to develop between people in the company. And I think that's really where the, a strong subculture exists is at the company level. But when that subculture is taken from you halfway through, it does take a while to redevelop that subculture once again. And there are two kinds of shotgunning, right? There's the one where you are just all in different companies, and then there's where a, a class goes to one company, right? Am I correct yes, about sir. that, right? So the class may be going together is a little easier. Um, but that's where all your clubs come into play, your clubs and your, um, you know, your sports, your teams. Those maybe are then this, the thing that stays the same. And I'm not sure if, well, maybe this club or any other uh, groups that you're part of, they become really, really important, I would guess, right? Are you members of other clubs that you, that you feel really close to? I mean, this is one example of that for me, where the history major and then the activities I'm involved in outside of the history major have provided some of that continuity that you're talking oh, that's about. That's fantastic. So I came here when I was 28. And um, so I've been here for a really long time. And when I first came here, having studied Russia, and then I came here, I didn't know much about the academy. So I come from a, my family's, I'm bicultural, I'm from a German background. And so I really didn't know much about the Naval Academy at all. And I'm embarrassed to say almost nothing. And so when I was offered the position here to teach in the Languages and Cultures Department, um, as an anthropologist, I was like, well, I got to study this. <laughs> so, so I have, and I've actually written a little bit about it. But it was always completely, I'm the outsider. You guys are the inside. So maybe we should switch it around, and I ask the questions, and I can take notes. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're here to listen to the expert, yeah, though. That's yeah. <laughs> Definitely. When you studied uh, culture here formally, what surprised you most in that process? So I guess that goes to the uniqueness of the Naval Academy, and that's what really stood out to me. I mean, I went to Bowdoin College, then I went to the University of Chicago, not military environments. So, of course, the first thing that struck me was this incredible um, a seriousness that midshipmen have and their approach to professors. I mean, at, when I, I was pretty young, when I came here, being called ma'am, like, rocked my world. I didn't, and not in a good way. I was like, I am not. Because to me, that just aged me tremendously, and I wasn't happy with it yet. Now I'm okay with it. Um, but yeah, so the seriousness, the passion that midshipmen show, um, this... This, I don't think many campuses or students on campuses think about their values on a daily basis <laughs> as the way I've seen midshipmen think and talk about their beliefs and values and dilemmas they face in terms of who they are, not only as individuals and American citizens, but as midshipmen and future officers. This, this sense of this idea that you have a mission, um, that is something that struck me as incredibly unique and um, 
you know, I always had my own mission, but I didn't think other people did too at my age and certainly not younger. And uh, my mission was, you know, to, to open the doors for mutual understanding throughout the world. That was sort of a big thing for me. Um, but you really had at a very young age this idea that you were going to become officers. And, and, and that is what you talk about and that is what you think about and that is what you argue about. Um, and I think that was just this pride and passion that you showed was really, really surprised me. Of course, the whole military stuff, the marching, you know, took me f for a surprise. I mean, it was, I was completely surprised. I remember walking my first summer here. I'd just gotten an office here and I had this mutt from the streets of Chicago and we were walking, you know, just around the yard. And it was early in the morning. I mean, it was really early. And these plebes were being yelled at and marched towards me. So I was like, okay, we have to make a turn. So I turned. They were coming down Stribling, I think. So I took a turn. I'm not allowed to go on Stribling with a dog anyway. But so I turned. And there was another group of plebes being yelled at coming at me. And so now I was, I really had to do like a 180. So I went the other way and the marching band was coming. <laughs> so I was like, this is like really early in the morning before most you know, students are up. And um, so things like that, of course, surprised me. But, but in a meaningful way, I think it is really, um, you as students have surprised me, and they continue to surprise me. Professor, I have a follow-up on that. You talked about your mission being opening the doors for a mutual understanding. And the culture here, like we've talked about, is top-down. Does the Naval Academy do a good job of preparing officers for the cross-cultural competencies that we talked about, if it's such a strong top-down culture? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you have other opportunities. But for one thing, I think you're being tested every day um, and brought into new situations as leaders in Bancroft Hall that I hear about now that my sons are and were here. But so I, I'm, you know, you are obviously always put into situations where you have to think on your feet and adapt. Um, in terms of open, being open to other cultures and societies, we do have, you do have a lot of opportunities, or let me say, Given the proper grades, <laughs> you have opportunities. I think you said you might be going to Taiwan, which is exciting. And you've been to Vietnam, right? And you have been, wait, there's another person here who has been somewhere else. Where were you? France. France, France, right, France. So I don't know if it was with the Naval Academy or not, but we do have the international program. Um, you know, so you can go abroad for a semester or you can go on an LREC, right? Language, regional expertise and culture study tour. Um, and then you have language study abroad programs, which I think are all opportunities for you to be put into situations where you have to then adapt. Now, for the, summer, for the semester abroad, we used to have a class that would try to prepare you. Um, I think we're not doing that anymore, but certainly you're going to get briefs. I think um, your classes are great opportunities for you to think about what might be when you go abroad. Um, so your history courses, certainly, um, you know, your language, language courses, if you're taking any. So I think between the, the thinking about foreign places and the doing in a small scale in Bancroft Hall, I think do afford you the experiences that, that will ultimately equip you to be adaptable. But I have to tell you that, so, and, and in the way that puts you ahead of many, of many students. Um, on the other hand, truly immersing yourself in a foreign culture, you know, you can't be prepared for that without just doing it, right? I think that is going to be your best preparation. So does the Naval Academy do a good job? I think um, in bits and pieces, yes. And if you can take advantage of an abroad program, then definitely. Professor, to kind of go back to your point about when you see Michigan having a greater sense of purpose, do you think that's what midshipmen come to the academy already having, or do you think that type of purpose is nurtured by the organizational and informal culture during their time here? Ah, uh, well, so I think that's a question for you. <laughs> 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 I want to know that from you. I mean, I have ideas about it. I think if I watched my, my kids, you know, before they came here, um, they had some purpose, yeah. <laughs> but I definitely think it grew while they were here. And I, I would say that it grew as their relationships developed and they started caring about each other here at the academy. I think those friendships and those bonds did that to them. Now, you have to answer, though. Of course, of course, Professor. Um, 
I think I would probably be very similar to your sons in the sense that like I came to the academy knowing that I have a sense, some sense of wanting to serve, but I didn't know, really know what that meant at the age of like 17 and 18. But once, you, uh, once I came to the academy, um, a common saying at the academy is people come to the academy for some reason and oftentimes the reason they stay is for a different reason. And I think the different reason for, for, for me personally is probably um, the bonds I made. I couldn't my, imagine myself at another university just because of the shared common experiences we've had as a class and as an institution is so powerful. It creates that sense of duty and sense of wanting to do stuff, serve others as opposed to focusing on myself. And I guess to build off of that point, I, a question I have for you is what role do you think common experiences have in terms of creating a very strong organizational or informal culture? So just when you said that, I was thinking there is a positive way to say this and a, you know, a little bit more uh, difficult way to say it, which is your common experience isn't all, you know, you know, you know, running, dancing into the sunset, you know, it's, it's hard here. Your, your lives are hard. And um, so the, the complexity that you, that your experience comes with, comes with this special bond, right? So for example, if I study Russia and I talk to people in Russia and they're so happy and proud to be Russian, some might want to move away because things are tough, but they will always have this affinity towards being Russian and their motherland, right? And a lot of that comes because they've had a really tough common experience. Some would say they've been victimized. Some would say they've had, you know, I mean, they've just have, had, historically, Russia has had a tough time. Now, that's not the Naval Academy. That being said, you've had some tough times. You've had some great times. You've had some difficult times here. And I would say the intensity here, because you're not allowed to le come and go as you please and make a lot of decisions should we keep going? Okay. And make a, and, and so the, the fact that you can't, um, let me go back to that thought again. So the fact that you've been in this enclosed environment, the yard, you can't just leave, come and go, you know, as you please. You can't get up when you want and think about going to class or not. You know, there's this structure that you have to, within which you have to function and work every day. And that creates a bond as well because you're in it together, right? You're in it together. And that intensity, I think, is what really, that common experience is what is special here. Um, you know, I've had, I had a great time in college. Do I have the same bonds with my peers? I do not, I do not. And they haven't carried me through my, the, my entire life. Some people do, if you join a fraternity, maybe, right? And that's more about the good times, right? But here you have not just the good times, and that makes it just a little bit more powerful. Professor, I was thinking when you were saying that about how diverse the student body is here, and it's diverse along socioeconomic and racial lines, but also why people come here I think is also diverse. So you have some people who come here for a varsity sport, some people who come because their parents were enlisted in the Navy or Marine Corps, some people who come right out of high school. So some people take a year at a civilian college and then they come here. So all these different reasons why people come, and some are more attuned to the military side of things, some less so. But I think it is the common experience that you're talking about where it doesn't matter so much why people come in the first place as it does their experiences here and the, the values that they, that they are instilled with. So when you came here, did you come here because of family or, or what was your drive? I, I had a family connection professor. My brother uh, was enlisted in the Marine Corps, so he told me about this place. And otherwise, I would have I would have probably never known about the Naval Academy. But he didn't end up coming here even as so he just said, go to the Naval Academy. Yes, ma'am. That's right. And was it a good decision for you? Did you feel like, how did that, I mean, was it hard for you to not follow in his footsteps, let's say, and, and, to, and then take a completely different path? It really wasn't, Professor, because we're pretty different people and have different interests, so that was kind of a natural fit, I think, for both of us. That's the other thing about the Naval Academy that it, you, you know, I think midshipmen and certainly I think I pride myself on working here as um, you know, it's a it's pretty it's an academic kind of place as well. So you have a nice um, you have this communion of you know the military experience, the military leadership training, um, the exposure to the options afterwards, and then of course the the academic side. So you do have, a, and that that makes it hard again though, because you have everything that's kind of pushed on you in a very intense way. And I always admire you. I I mean I could not 
do the work. I, I would have I would have failed, I think, if I had been in college here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could barely keep up with just my classes. Yeah. So. What do you think about some of the subcultures that seem to be so contrary to the overall values, like the Black End Society, for example, that prides themselves in getting demerits for conduct offenses in an institution that prides himself in following the rules and living by a certain moral code and, and regulations and all that. What do you make of that contradiction? Yeah, I, I'm not allowed to answer that. So, no, I'm kidding. So as an anthropologist, right, my job is not to judge, right? So I come in and I see this menu of things you do here and this menu of traditions that you have. And to me, especially the Black End Society, is a wonderful example of how times have changed and how, um, you know, something that is treasured by many and also argued against by quite a few from what I understand. And yet it prevails. And so, and, and the fact is, over time, how you get the black end, I find that fascinating. You know, what does it take to get it? Now it's a little bit harder, I hear, to get it because you might get kicked out before you get one, from what I understand. It's also, I wonder, I, and I love to hear more about it because it tells me about this dynamic, um, breathing, living culture that while things get passed down from generation to generation, they also change. And that's culture. Culture is not this thing that stays. The Naval Academy isn't the same, you know, over the years. It has, it's changed. And the Black End Society has changed. And yet it's great, I think, it's so much fun to, to for me as an anthropologist, it's just one other thing to learn about um, and what, you know, why, why is it still here? Because I think, and I would say that the reason it might have, might be prevailing is because there's a sense of hooliganism here that, that might, and, and according to some midshipmen I spoke to, hopefully, will never go away. So I wonder what you think about it. So I'm not here to tell you if it's like, what do I think about it, like good or bad. I just think it's a fascinating moment that is a great example of changes in Naval Academy culture and tradition. Professor, one of the things that we've talked about on some uh, prior episodes is why that hooliganism exists. And we've heard from some old graduates that our natural reaction to all of the rules is just to push back a little bit and then to be a little bit rebellious because of the fact that we're college students. Uh, rebellious nature is probably <laughs> natural to us at this age. What do you make of that theory? But is it just college students? I mean, yeah, college kids, sure. You know, we had pranks when I in, in college as well. But um, I think it's part of a military tradition. I think um, if you go beyond the Naval Academy and you look to the officers, they have their own hooligan moments as well. And I could list them if I had my cheat cards with me of the different societies that are among enlisted, among officers in the Marine Corps in particular. You might want to ask your brother about that, you know, where they get together and they, they do fun, silly, maybe prank-like kinds of things. Um, and, and there's, okay, so here's something you've, you can consider publishing or not. But um, if you see remnants, or not remnants, but um, you see the, the hooliganism of the officers continued here at the Naval Academy. Did you know? So for example, you have graffiti here at the Naval Academy, and a, a student of mine did a study of graffiti here at the Academy. It was a great, uh, Mitchip and Parker, great, great um, study um, in which he took pictures of the graffiti on the yard. And, um, and one of the places, or a couple of the places actually, that you find them are in the dome of the chapel that you should never go to on your own, verboten, forbidden. Um, but if you can get, your, get permission to go up there, it's actually a little, I think it's a little bit daring, I think it's actually dangerous. You'll find graffiti from former superintendents who have put their mark up there. And they didn't do that officially, right? That was like, oh yeah, you know, I get to do this now and put my mark on the academy. So that kind of, it's, it's what is graffiti, right? Graffiti is many, many things. And one of it is to put your mark somewhere, to say I've been here. Um, but also uh, tricky situations like the chap chapel dome, right? Or I think there are parts in Dahlgren that, that have it as well. You know, that takes a little bit of effort, right? So there's that sense of hooliganism that keeps going even after you graduate. So I think it's military culture, right? Yeah, for sure. And just a bit off of that point, um, I can say as myself as a midshipman, it's very interesting when we talk about cultures as midshipmen in the moment. 
we want to contribute to the culture itself. We want to have an impact, right? I, I think to myself when I do, you know, as a plea doing these plea pranks that I'm part of something bigger than myself. I am, you know, changing in a, in a way, have a small impact on the future culture um, of the academy itself. And I think that's or, a really... Or just continuing the legacy exactly, of yeah. the culture. And I think that's a very um, interesting dynamic that we see within the academy itself is how midshipmen right now, what legacy are they going to leave for future generations, future classes to see, and how does that impact how they you know interact with the academy but um professor one question that i thought was very interesting is when we talk about organizational culture and informal culture at times especially at the academy they can sometimes clash a little bit and i was just interested in when when as an organization you know what type of tactics or what type of socialization tactics would one use to try to cultivate a good informal culture because i would say at the academy we have a very strong organizational and informal culture but when we think about the big picture as being officers future officers of ships what are ways that what are ways that upper leadership can establish strong culture that also has a positive impact on the informal culture as well so your leadership knows better how to be leaders but um, but I would say that the informal culture I would say to them um, that informal culture culture that tra- that challenges the system even just ever so slightly, is a good thing to have. I think, you know, hooliganism, if we go back to that, is an outlet, right? A way to just keep a sense of humor alive, to maybe let off some steam. Um, but it also can question what is happening at the in an institution. So subcultures are often, before they become counterculture, which is like rebellion or something, right? Just a nudge to say, hey, we wonder about this. You know, let's think about what's going on and let's have a dialogue or let's have a conversation. In a place where you have a top-down approach, the dialogue, you can't can't just knock on the soup store and say, hey, I want to have a dialogue about this. So it's how else can you make a point but to maybe nudge with some of the um, informal cultures that you have here at the academy. Does that make sense to you? So I think about the printer situation at the Naval Academy. So, you know... There we are, Annapolis residents, peering over the walls, and these printers go flying out of windows. And if we can't see it over the walls, you know, we might notice it on, you know, Instagram or something. So, you know, and so to the outsider, that looks like, oh, my God, these guys don't respect that what they have, they, the material, they throw it out the window. That is not what that tip of the iceberg, right? That was one of your questions, I think, like, that is a tip of the iceberg moment, right? You see something, but you don't know the meaning until you dig a little bit deeper, right? So to dig a little bit more deeply, you might ask the question, is it really just because they're, they hate their printers? Or, you know, or is it really because they just have too many printers? Eh, maybe. But, um, you know, you tell me. I, I, you know what? Here, I'm going to, th- I, th- I have an idea, and I might add to it. Why were y'all throwing the printers out the window? Was it because you hate your printers? <laughs> That's a, a tough one. This is a tough one. Am I mean? Should I? Okay, try it, and if I'll help you. Well, first of all, just for the record, I, I never threw a printer. Actually, Good for so. you. <laughs> there you go. But I think that at that time there was a little bit of frustration over how the, our situation was being handled. We wanted to be midshipmen, which is going down to King Hall and eating together, and going to sports teams and playing sports together, and getting together in classrooms. We are here in Annapolis, but we weren't able to be midshipmen. There was, I think, a little safety valve, some frustration, and then it needed to be let out with a little safety valve. And that's an example of you wanted to have a dialogue, and you couldn't knock on anyone's doors, right? Because of the top-down approach, there was a response that was benign to a degree, but it was sort of saying, hey, we, we want to talk, <laughs> right? And, and it wasn't just, I think, maybe I, it, there was frustration. It was also a little bit of ennui, right? Like, like, what else can we do, right? We're sitting here in our rooms again, right? So, um, but that's an example of where it, it nudges people to consider, uh, you know, how are we leading midshipmen? Do we make a change? And now, of course, COVID restricted some of the things that the leadership could do for you because it was beyond their reach as well. But that was an example. Um, yeah. 
Well, Professor, I've got a question now uh, in the same vein. The printer situation, I think, is something that was magnified by social media. And social media does have an impact back on the culture of the brigade, both public forms of social media like Instagram and then anonymous forms like Yodel. And Yodel, there's, there's a lot of stuff that I think people would be surprised it's coming from midshipmen. Uh, can you talk about that? I, I don't know what to make of it myself. Do you, so you read Yodel? I actually don't. I know yeah. my friend Calvin here. Uh-huh. I do. I am, okay. I am a common reader of Yodel, and it's uh-huh. very interesting. Yeah. Are you surprised by what you see? I think I am surprised because I think, especially at the Academy, there is a culture of buying in where there's some, there's some things you think in your head that would not be appropriate to say out loud to whether your classmates or especially officers. But these are perhaps sometimes pent up emotions, and Yodel is an outlet for them. As you talked about, it's like that nudge. And what's very interesting is I've heard from many officers now that oftentimes the brigade leadership sometimes uses Yodel as a source of, you know, authentic feedback. And that makes it have a very interesting and unique role in the academy. Yeah, I think it's you're absolutely right. Right. That is another nudge moment that you can nudge because, again, it's hard in your uniform to represent some of the things you believe and feel or express them to your leadership because they might not even listen to it. And so that is one way that you can say, hey, even though we all look like everything's just dandy, we have some questions here. <laughs> and, 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 and so the way it's expressed might be questionable sometimes on Yodel. But if you actually just look at what's being said, it, you know, and sometimes, sometimes what's on Yodel is absolutely not the majority opinion, right? So I've, I've seen that too, that it's one, the one off, and then that doesn't really represent the academy. But it's good to know. So I've seen, for example, people who are in distress go to Yodel. Um, and so that immediately usually starts this reaction of people trying to reach out to that person. So again, because maybe they don't feel safe in a military hierarchy to seek the help that they need, right? Um, historically, that has been sometimes difficult. Um, so, so this is a way for them to get the help they need. So it's not a bad thing, I would say. But again, I'm not judging. <laughs> I'm the anthropologist. I just think all of these things, these are what you're talking, what you're asking me about are cultural moments, cultural artifacts, cultural you know, statements um, that express a climate that express values and beliefs that that should be at least looked at and respected, whether or not you like it or you know want to get rid of it, but at least think about it. Right? Well, professor, to conclude this afternoon, I think we've talked about some positive aspects of academy culture and then some aspects of culture that people might be surprised by. But what is one aspect of culture here that you would like to see preserved going forward? So the hooliganism. I think that should be preserved. Of course, you know, you're, oh, the parades, they're wonderful, and you would, I, I know you midshipmen don't love them, but, you know, those are for the outside, they're wonderful. And, and the fact that, you know, I think the, the academics, I think, are pretty gosh darn good here. Um, I think your, the leadership training that you have, those are all things that um, anybody could say about this place. But as an anthropologist, I'm going to say that I like the hooliganism because that is where things happen, where, where you find what people are thinking, feeling, where people are having fun, um, continuing traditions. For example, you know, just even Herndon is a little bit of hooliganism. How are you going to get the cap up, up and down? You know, how are you going to, or the cover, how are you going to do, actually it's not, it's a Dixie cup, right? Yes, ma'am. All right, got that right. Yeah, so, um, so, you know, all of those things are part of this culture that are playful. Some of it's playful, some of it's serious, um, but it's all part of this vibrant, um, exciting place. I mean, if we didn't have that, that wouldn't be, then we wouldn't have midshipmen to my, in my mind. You got to have it to continue the culture. Well, thank you so much, Professor, for your time this afternoon. We really appreciate it, and it was a fascinating discussion for us. Thank you for having me, and I hope I said everything okay. This concludes our interview with Professor Fujimura about what culture is and how organizational and informal culture are formed within the Naval Academy. We want to thank Professor Fujimura for spending her time with us today and for sharing her research and experiences. 
This has been the Midshipman Produced Podcast, Life at the Academy, recording from the Naval Academy's Sampson Hall in Annapolis, Maryland. On behalf of the USNA History Department and our midshipmen hosts and producers, thank you for listening. We look forward to seeing you next time.